All right, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Britt, and I'm very excited to present to you our webinar today. And the topic, 2000, 2023 Trends and Innovations in the Senior Living Hospitality. So really, we wanna talk about what is exciting in terms of trends that are coming to the senior living hospitality space in this new year. Now, in our webinar, our experts in the field will look across all areas of food service and hospitality and really try to uncover and do a deep dive into those trends and innovations. So this should be a really exciting presentation. Uh, today, we have our expert, Aaron Fish, CEO and founder of Trestle Hospitality Concepts. Aaron has nearly 30 years of experience in the hospitality and senior living realms. His focus really has been on elevating the customer experience, and he's worked with some top hospitality chains as well as being a senior living operator. And he really has the expertise and the unique ability to build customer-focused food and hospitality programs and operations. Uh, today, we also have Todd Olson, our very own Todd Olson, who is our contract sales in our Minneapolis office. Todd has been employed in the food service industry since 1985, which is really hard to believe, Todd, because you don't look that old. But for the, old, last 35, <laughs> for the last 35 years, Todd's been assisting clients in the design, specification, installation of a wide variety of food service projects. He is a, a CFSP certified food service professional. And he's demonstrated vast knowledge in terms of equipment, design, application for food preparation, traffic flow, and a, uh, operational efficiency. We also are very pleased to have our own Bill Ziegler here. He is the Director of Contract and Design in our Minnesota office. Like many of us here at Belter, he has been in the food service industry his entire adult life. Um, Bill started working for a giant national restaurant equipment dealer. Then he moved to Waymar Industries, which is a manufacturer of furnishings for the hospitality industry, um, eventually becoming president, owning that company. Um, after selling, he was the CEO of Premier Restaurant Equipment, which is in Minneapolis, which Belter acquired. Uh, Bill brings so much to the table from his expertise at Premier. He also worked as a uh, a big part for BGD companies. And this is a small boutique manufacturer of furniture. So he really is our in-house expert on anything related to dining furniture and all aspects, all segments. But we really look for him and be a key collaborator on initiatives related to senior living and marketing, all that stuff. So he heads our Minnesota office and we're very, very happy to have all three of you gentlemen here. Thank you for being here. Uh, before we Thanks begin, yeah. Thank you. Um, we are going to just ask that if any of our attendees have questions, to please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our very best to, to get those answered after the presentation. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Aaron Fish and the gentleman. Thanks, Britt. Um, excited to be here and talk about trends. You know, we're right in the thick of the new year and so everybody's talking about them and so uh, i wanted to start off by just quickly kind of looking at what the senior living industry trends are right we've done a lot of looking at, at what people are saying in the industry um and we wanted to kind of look at kind of five big areas and we want to bring these up because as we talk about and get into kind of the specifics of the senior living hospitality trends we want you to be thinking about these five things and how all of this is going to impact and support, um, you know, success in, in dealing with these things. And so the, the first trend is kind of obvious. We've been dealing with this for many months now. It's the staffing challenges, right? You know, we, we're still dealing with that. We've lost over 300,000 workers through the pandemic and, and coming out of it. And so, you know, we really just need to focus on how are we going to attract employees, how do we retain them, uh, and, and how can we really uh, dive in and deal with those challenges. The second, obviously, is the ongoing impact of COVID-19, right? It's still here. We're still dealing with new variants and uh, the, the vaccine plans and the rollouts. And so as much as, you know, we, we're getting further and further away from the, the height of it, we're still having to deal with the impact of COVID-19 in everything we're doing. The third is kind of the financial fallout of the, you know, the pandemic and the current economic climate, right? 
We're dealing with a lot of high inflation, rising interest rates, which are squeezing margins for operators and really having an impact on those expenses that maybe were projected out uh, you know, long term. So we really have to think about how can we impact that area and the financial concerns that we have. Uh, a little bit bigger picture on that, thinking about the financing challenges. This is kind of that fourth uh, trend and outlook point. And really, you know, lenders are a little more cautious, loan rates and things are, are increasing. And so um, the money is going to get a little bit tighter as we look to develop, um, which kind of leads us to number five, which is occupancy growth, right? You know, we've seen here in the last couple of weeks, um, Nick has come out with some really great information about that. Um, demand is obviously strong. We know that it's going to be strong over the next few years, but we're still in recovery mode from an occupancy perspective, right? We haven't reached pre-pandemic levels, and a lot of industry experts think it's going to take several more years to get there. And so all the things that I think we're going to talk about with Bill and Todd and myself are really going to kind of impact and, and have an effect on these things as we go forward. So, so let's dive in, right? So we want to start with talking about food and menu trends. So what, what are the industry looking for? You know, I always think we should look at what are commercial restaurants and hospitality industry folks doing because senior living tends to kind of fall in line with that, you know, 18 months or so behind. And so really want to kind of look at that. And we've got quite a few that we're gonna look at. And so obviously we wanna look at what trends are gonna be kind of immediate impact for operators as well as kind of some longer term things towards the end of the year. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about these. So comfort fair continuing, you know, this is not a new thing for senior living, but it's something that uh, families and guests of residents are gonna be looking for. Um, but we're looking really kind of doing it with a twist, right? How do you bring global flavors, global fare into that? There's going to be a lot more demand for those kinds of foods that have a twist. Um, so that's one area to be looking at. Another is menu streamlining, right? So thinking about those comfort foods, but how do you pare down offerings that can give you a good return on your investment? can really help you better manage your food costs and expenses that you're experiencing um, through your vendors and your suppliers. A couple of ways you can look at this, right? Um, a lot of people are looking at the less expensive meat cuts. Think chicken thighs, beef chuck, pork shoulder, um, not traditionally things that are going to be center of the plate that we've used in the past, but there's a lot of opportunity there from both introducing new menu items, uh, variations on some favorites, as well as helping with those expense and, and margin concerns. So a lot of opportunity there. Um, and this was just a fun one that we found that I think is, is worth mentioning. Um, charcuterie boards, right? We're always looking for unique lighter meal options in senior living. And so um, I've seen these with uh, operators I've worked with in the past where a lot of success in having these as uh, main meal options for those lighter fare. And so, um, again, kind of something new and unique and fun that operators can look towards when they're looking at menus uh, and some fun trends coming online. So uh, a few things that are a little bit longer term that we wanna look at. Um, and I know Todd and Bill, you've got some insight on these, but the first one is enhanced beverage programming, right? Um, a lot of the retail operators are really looking at non-alcoholic beverage menus, right? Like what kind of mocktails, spritzes, things of those nature that you can bring in. And they're a great fit for senior living, especially as we look at um, what are our new residents looking for you know, and I know there's a lot of design implications that go along with that, Todd, from um, looking at what you can do around beverage programming. Yeah, for sure. We um, <clears throat> we were chatting a little bit about um, just a lot of the senior living uh, locations are looking at um, putting in full liquor license bars as well. So they, you know, senior living has pretty much had uh, a type of bar or a pub that's really more of a residential style in the past where maybe the resident would, you know, bring their own bottle, um, that kind of a thing. 
But uh, lately, we've we've seen a trend towards uh, putting in real full liquor license bars, multiple bars in in the location, really, and uh, that's something that seems to be um, really taking off. And and uh, and you know the the process of getting a full liquor license can be arduous. So it's something definitely you have to check with the cities and the municipalities, make sure that. What, what's possible and what's required to do that um, is definitely something to take a look at as well. So that's, um, I mean, full liquor license bars. Uh, I think when I finally get to a senior living place, I, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. You know, I've, I've had experience with some of that in the past and you're right. Like the local municipalities can, can really throw a wrench into that with their various different regulations um, but there's also, a, you know, an owner operator benefit too, as far as valuation of your property. And I know we've spoken about that in previous webinars. So that's a really good call out as far as the licensure. So um, another thing that uh, we really want to look at, and this kind of covers our next two bullet points, is the creating experiences for our residents, right? We're, we're talking about the older boomers now starting to, to look at communities and have an interest in active adult and independent living, definitely. And so how do you do that for them as well as creating local collaborations, right? So things like working with uh, local vendors on packaging their products, um, you know, local honey vendors and creating your own products with that, your own spin with your chef. Uh, there's definitely things that can be done there. Um, and there's even a lot of push recently with farm to table. Uh, and I'm curious what you guys have seen around farm to table from uh, some of the customers and clients you guys work with. Yeah, it's definitely something we're we're seeing as well. Um, something to um, to keep in mind as far as when you're designing a food service facility in a senior living place, if they are doing farm to table, you know you want to make sure that you've got the right equipment for that, for the fresh food, you've got to be able to store that. So you really need that, you know, the walk-ins need to be stored correctly or sized correctly for that. Uh, even things like um, produce washing systems are, are popular as well. I know that there's a number of manufacturers, Power Soak comes to mind. Uh, they have a, uh, obviously they have a system where you can wash um, your pots and pans system, but they've also got one that allows you to wash produce um, and just being able to handle that that fresh um, produce is is a, is a big deal, and make sure that there's no bacteria in there when you're serving it. What well, one question I had, Todd, was you know there's a a big push in kind of the commercial restaurant industry to do like your own in-house butchering, you know, bringing in whole meats and breaking them down and doing that. Do you see a lot of that happening in senior living with projects you guys are working on? I haven't seen much lately, but I wouldn't be surprised if that might be coming. I know from a labor standpoint, that might be something that uh, may, may be a bit arduous to get through, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes up in the future. I have not seen that in some of the projects that I've designed so far, but wouldn't shock me. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then we have our last kind of food and menu trend. And Bill, I know you've worked with a lot of clients on this one. But, you know, we talk a lot about like creating a, an experience and kind of this resort country club living, sure. but it's really something that's coming on strong here as of late. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you hear a lot of discussion about how much dining programs drive occupancy at senior living. It's really one of the, the leading qualifiers for why people choose to live where they choose to live. Um, but it goes, it goes beyond just is the food good? Uh, you know, is the chef talented? It gets into what does the dining room look like? What are the dining options? Are there grab and go options? Are there pubs and so on? Um, a lot of it is talked about as restaurant style dining. Is there an a la carte menu? How are you ordering? But but I think of it more as not only resort style living, but or dining, but country club style. You know, you get to a country club. Um, at a country club, people tend to know the servers. They tend to even know the chef. Those same types of things start, start to take place at, at senior living. Um, and so, you know, you've got to kind of design around that. So think not only about restaurant style dining, but think about, about that resort living or country club style living. Yeah, no, it's, it's really great. And, and it kind of leads us into 
the next thing we want to talk about, which is labor and staffing. You know, there's a few things around this that I think are of note, especially when we think about that resort style, country club style living, right? Those are the kinds of employees we look for, for senior living, food and hospitality. And so um, three things I wanted to kind of bring up around labor and staffing. Um, one is, I think you've seen a lot of it around kind of worker activism. There's a lot of momentum, especially in food service around um, a lot of change and improving work environments. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation around that. Like, what are we going to do um, to better support employees? And so I think it's going to be something that's going to get a lot of talk over the next few months about what does that look like? Um, the second one is creating flexibility for employees, right? This is going to be critical for recruitment and retention. You know, we've kind of always maybe had our set schedules. And when you think about, you know, operators doing their meals at 8, 12, and 5, and they schedule around that, there's going to have to be flexibility for our residents, but employees are going to be wanting and demanding it as well. So I think that's another factor. Um, and then the last one is the benefit offerings, right? This has always been uh, an opportunity, I think, for senior living and attracting people from hospitality. We talk about work hours, we talk about benefit packages. Well, hospitality organizations are feeling the pinch as well. And so they're starting to up their benefits game. And so it's something that we have to consider in our industry um, that we're now competing directly with benefit packages in restaurant operations that are similar. So we've got to think about what we can do, right? And so what strategies can we think about, right? And we've got a few that I think are, are really key. Um, the first is, you know, building your brand, right? I've worked with a number of operators around this idea of not just putting out your job description as a job ad, right? But really creating a brand, you know, you're doing it for your residents with your program. You got to do it for your employees as well, especially if you want to get that top talent and keep them. So you want to get that executive chef that's well known. You want to get those professional servers. They got to know that they're coming to work for a hospitality oriented organization. So that's definitely a key, I think. Uh, second is we talked about the benefits, right? So starting to think outside the box and create these kind of unique packages around what we do. You know, things that we've started to see that I think are going to really gain a lot of traction. Think, you know, day, the pay, uh, you know, pay the day of um, for workers. Um, scheduling tech, you know, continuing to really push the envelope from scheduling. Um, and then really looking at customizable work weeks and even the concept of unlimited PTO for frontline staff. You know, there's some benefits on both sides for a program like that that can definitely be explored and, and can really bring out um, some opportunities for uh, retaining employees. And then I think, you know, when you look at employee development, I think this is really important, right? What are, you, what are we doing around that? I know we've got a lot of talk about that's a focus for the industry. Um, but creating career paths, right? Like how does somebody who maybe is in school as a nurse uh, go for their nursing degree, but maybe they could start working for us as a server uh, or in our kitchens and then develop into that director of nursing. You know, things of that nature, I think are really important. Uh, and then really looking at some micro learning and artificial intelligence. These are things that are gonna really hit us hard and heavy you know, there's a lot of talk about like chat GPT and what are the opportunities with things like that. And so I think there's some really unique employee development opportunities um, out there. But I also know that we've got to think about operationally, what are we doing, right? And so I know when we think about what our operations look like, what is the flow of them, what does design look like, um, what can we do in those areas uh, Todd, that can really have an impact for labor management. Yeah, I mean that. I think that's that's one thing that's that's pretty major in the industry is the shortage of labor. And I know you kind of went through that a bit before, but um, just in the initial design, a lot of this becomes more of an architectural uh, design up front. But um, we have a lot of facilities that uh, you know have been able to 
design the different food venues in a way that they're adjacent to or very close to the main kitchen. Um, it, it helps so much with just staffing and labor to move the food. Um, if it can be dished up, plated in the main kitchen and served directly out of there, whether it's, you know, it could be a memory care area, a memory care wing, um, if that's close to that main kitchen. Uh, or it could even be something like, uh, obviously, the assisted living. Memory care and assisted living is three meals a day. So, I mean, that's the, the main driver. Um, if you do have to, to, obviously, it doesn't always work to have those venues right off the kitchen, depending on how everything is laid out, whether it's a new facility, whether it's an existing facility that adds on a wing, well, then obviously, it's not, not going to be a possibility. But I think paying attention to that a bit in the upfront design um, makes a whole lot of sense. And even, uh, you know, we, we've worked with some facilities that have a, actually had the memory care, the assisted living, the bistro bar, even a buffet set up really right off of that main kitchen, whether that's on the first floor, the second floor, whatever it may be. Um, it just helps so much on the operations side of things. I think it's, it's something to think about. Uh, not always possible, obviously, but definitely something to uh to consider yeah i mean i just think about it operationally like if i can cut down the number of steps and add a task or two onto an employee uh, with some extra training definitely can help operators and staff in the long run so great points on that so um let's talk a little bit about let's dive into that a little bit further let's talk about design and development trends right and i know um as we kind of were preparing for this, you guys came up with some areas that I think we really want to talk about. And so um, let's start with talking about dining room design trends. And Bill, I know this is your kind of sweet spot. Yeah, you're absolutely. Expertise. So I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing. Sure. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of, of interior design groups around the country that specialize solely in senior living. Uh, you know, Britt has heard me talk over and over and over about a group called Tomaholic Design in Phoenix. And you can go on their website and, and see lots of beautiful dining rooms, again, that are more reflective of what you'd probably see at a country club than what you would think of as senior living. Um, I actually had lunch yesterday with Steve Cohen, who's, who's with Shelby Williams. They provide a lot of furniture to the senior living industry and was sort of tapping him for some uh, design trends as well. And he sees the same things. Oh, there's a lot of use of Booth seating and banquettes that you didn't used to see in senior living. I think it's important that that as, as that's being designed into dining rooms, that you do go to a custom manufacturer and have that product built. It, it does require, if you're building banquettes and booth seating and lounge furniture for that common area furniture, you do want to pay caref careful attention to foam densities, seat heights, the pitch on the back of chairs and booth seating, because you got to make this easy to get into and easy to get out of. Um, you see a lot of bold patterns and prints on fabrics. Uh, that's changed so much in the last few years as, as Krypton treatment of fabrics has come around. You don't have to go to an old healthcare style looking upholstery material. Uh, fabrics can be treated with Krypton. You can use silicone upholstery materials on seats of chairs and on booths. And all those things are easy to clean resistant to typical types of spills and accidents that you see in senior living. So it's, it's important to pay attention to that type of stuff. Um, Steve was telling me yesterday at lunch, you know, Shelby Williams has developed a product called Tough Grain. It's a chair that, that mimics the look of very traditional looking senior living chairs and bar stools and so on. But instead of being a, made out of wood, it's made out of aluminum and the aluminum is painted to really exactly resemble wood but it's product that stands up to the cleaning environment that you have right now because of COVID and because of, of the, the typical things you run into in senior living and, and healthcare environments. So, you know, you also see casters on the front legs of chairs now in senior living, um, always armchairs. Uh, and then of course you have to pay careful attention to ADA requirements, obviously, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's there's uh, width restrictions and depth restrictions, height restrictions for tabletops in particular so that people in wheelchairs can get access to tables. Um, so you have to pay careful attention to that. It is, it is interesting to know that, that uh, maybe not all of your tables need to be set up for ADA wheelchair compliance all the time in a senior living facility. 
because I think as we all know, seniors tend to eat at the same table every day. So they, they tend to treat their dining room as their home. And just like you have the spot that you sit in at your table at home, they have the spot that they sit in their dining room in senior living. So uh, those are just some trends that I'm seeing. Yeah, no, that's, that's great stuff. And I think a lot of that is, is really important. And, you know, we, we have to transition out of that healthcare mindset to the hospitality. And I think a lot of the things you're talking about really speak to that. Um, I want to move kind of maybe in towards the back of the house, Todd, and talk a little bit about what kind of equipment innovations are you seeing going forward? Yeah, it's, um, you know, there's, there's always been um, a, a push towards the combi ovens of the world and that kind of thing in the back kitchen, but we're looking at um, utilizing ventless equipment in a lot of different locations these days. It really opens up that ability to add a venue to maybe an existing facility that um, would be very prohibitive to try to get, you know, duct work through to add a hood for cooking capability, but maybe they wanna add a, a bistro or maybe a bar that has the capability to make pizza, uh, that kind of a thing. Using that ventless equipment, whether that's a Mary Chef or a Turbo Chef, that kind of a thing has really helped out. And even we're working with uh, a couple of facilities, one up in Alexandria that's looking at putting in a couple of double stack combi ovens that are electric and they are uh, ventless. Uh, so they're they're actually right adjacent to the to the main kitchen. But if they were to try to put a hood in, it would just you know the cost would be um, more than would be able to be absorbed by the by that facility. So I think the ability to use that ventless equipment has been kind of a game changer in adding venues to existing facilities and even adding adding venues to the new facility as well. So I think that's. Uh, Something to consider. I know um, just adding venues that are, uh, you know, cooking classes and taste testing uh, opportunities are always big as well. That could that could flow into a bistro area. That could flow into a bar area. Whatever would work for that particular um, location. But um, some of those innovations have been crucial with um, really creating more of a restaurant style dining venue than maybe your senior living facilities were in the past. Yeah, no, that's a great call out, you know, because one of the things that I saw a lot of towards the end of last year and even earlier in the year last year was there was a lot of talk in the industry about how do we better engage our residents in general, right? How do we develop programming for them across the board? Um, and there's always been this, how do you bring food in? I think a lot of what you just said about the exhibition cooking and, and how do you engage residents with things of that nature, there's a lot of opportunity with that. And so one of the other things I've seen a lot of developers and, and owners talk about is how do we capitalize on outdoor spaces? How do we connect the residents with nature, if you will? And so, um, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts, maybe Todd, if you want to talk a little bit about what you've seen in, in outdoor spaces in design and development. Yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we have designed some commercial outdoor cooking locations in the past and in senior living. We do still see a lot of residential style, um, you know, a, 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 a broiler that's out there that maybe if your family comes to visit you, you're gonna go, you're gonna go visit grandma or you're gonna go visit mom in the senior place. And you, you're, you're, you'd like to be able to go outside and make, you know, bring your own food, cook it up on a nice grill, uh, that, that kind of a setting. Most of what we've seen is still kind of on the residential side of things where um, it's not really a, a commercial application, but, if they do decide to go down that path of commercial, there are a lot of health department requirements, especially in Minnesota here, which can be pretty tough on enclosed spaces being required. You know, you, you've got to have a roof on that area. You've got to have maybe a prep area, even um, depending on how they do it within the facility. So it's, it's definitely something that um, I think will develop more as things go on and even I know we were talking in the past, uh, Bill, you and I, and, and Aaron, about even um, 
being able to serve food in, in, in a pool site area, maybe, the, maybe the, like, like you said, like a country club type thing that might have the ability to serve food if somebody's sitting around a pool area. Uh, that's, that's something I think that will also develop more in the future. Um, and even seating, seating is a big deal out too with the, in pool areas, I would think, Bill. Yeah, and I can maybe touch on that a little bit. I think it's, it's really important when you start looking at outdoor dining seating uh, to understand that, that a significant amount of outdoor dining furniture uh, available in the United States comes from overseas, and it tends to come in being metric sized and, and doesn't always allow for adherence to Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines. So you have to pay careful attention to that. You need 30 inches of width, 19 inches clear to the first obstruction. Uh, and then, there, of course, there's there's also uh, height restrictions and so on that the bottom underside of the table has to be at least 27 inches in the air. And, and a lot of outdoor furniture does not comply with that. And, and if you're not careful about what you're, what's being designed and what's being bought, you wind up with inaccessible furniture outside, particularly if you put an umbrella on your table and you've got an umbrella base underneath it, which then means you have to spread the legs out and suddenly no one with a wheelchair can get within two feet of the table. So it's just something to pay, pay careful attention to that you that you look to uh, somebody like Belter who knows what they're doing in design and can lead you toward the right manufacturers and, and get things that actually work outside. Yeah, no, those are is a great point because I know that from an operator standpoint, you you want to look at those spaces like what is our opportunity? You know, being concerned about margins, you know, like the industry is. How can we capitalize on that? And, and there's a lot of opportunity with some of these spaces. And so yeah. they're not flexible or functional, like you're saying, Bill, to meet those needs. It could be a huge disadvantage um, operationally. Yeah, so. certainly. I mean, you could put beautiful 36 by 36 inch tables with an umbrella all around a pool, thinking that everyone's going to eat outside and, and not one of those spaces at the table can be seated with some in a wheelchair. So, yeah, um, you you that you kind of lead us into our next uh, consideration, which is the accessibility part, Bill. And so um, I'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit more maybe about cost versus needs and in, in the design aspect of that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. Britt and I have looked at a couple projects recently where, where you have what I would essentially think of as quick serve restaurant furniture in a dining room, which is completely inappropriate from, from a comfort standpoint or an accessibility standpoint. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you usually you're going to wind up seeing larger tabletops. Um, so, you know, you need, as, as I just mentioned, in, from an ADA setting, you need 30 inches of width, 19 inches clear to the first obstruction. That means that a tabletop starts at 42 by 42. And that's much larger than you would find in a restaurant, uh, much closer to what you'd probably find in a country club. But you have to pay careful attention to that or people just aren't going to have accessibility. Todd was working on a project recently where, where the operator wanted to have, Todd, what was it? They needed to have uh, table bases that were on casters uh, that had flip tops available to them. And they had all kinds of different uh, yeah, qualifications. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they, want, they wanted the ability to be able to adjust the table height-wise. Right, yes. And they wanted it to be mobile. So we needed to, we needed to source a mobile table base. Um, and then I think they used, um, I think they were 42 by 42 tabletops, if I remember right. But, right, and they um, wanted the top to flip, right? And they wanted the top to flip to be able to flip it out of the way, correct. Yeah, and I yeah. think you were able to source a, a manufacturer yeah. that gave us all those, so worked out well. Yeah, so certainly there are manufacturers like Space Tables and people like that who specialize in making table equipment for senior living that create accessibility. I think another thing that gets missed sometimes, hopefully not in a senior living setting, but you also need to follow ADA guidelines at any grab and go area, any coffee bar area. So you can't just put, uh, you know, uh, insulated coffee servers on a 42 inch high bar and expect anyone in a wheelchair to go, be able to go up and self-serve themselves coffee. So all those ADA guidelines, which are spelled out online, really need to be carefully adhered to uh, as it relates to accessibility to the, to the millwork package, to any of the furniture, any place that, that there's self-service things going on um, and so on. So, Yeah, and, and that kind of leads us into the last kind of number five consideration here. And that's that flexibility for growth and change, right? We've been talking about 
all of the different you know types of spaces and all the different considerations. But um, Todd, what what are you guys seeing around the ability for operators to grow and change with the the resident needs and demands um, on their op operations? Yeah, I mean, I think flexibility is the key to that uh, to to that idea, and and I think um, being able to design. Um, food service venues and architects are good with this, that, you know, that might be, you know, maybe there's a coffee shop type bistro uh, area that uh, during the day or in the morning, and then maybe at night uh, that could maybe convert into a bar. There's a, there's a local uh, place called the Good Day Cafe here locally in it. And in the morning uh, it, it serves breakfast. It serves a, uh, uh, all those items at lunch and then at night it's called the bad day bar so it, it's uh it's kind of a neat concept locally here in in minneapolis and we've been there many times but um just the convertibility of spaces i think is crucial um and you know that that could even flow into induction units uh there's a lot there's a lot of induction capabilities these days and one of the pieces that we've been using quite a bit is undermount induction uh, warmers. So you you actually mount these below a uh, say it's a quartz uh, tabletop that kind of thing or a counter. So you can't see that those items are there. But um, if you're going to use that maybe as a buffet during a part of the day or a special event, they actually just use a trivet system is what most of them use, and they put the trivet over it, and, an, and a light comes on, and then it becomes an induction warmer that you can put a buffet serving item on and use that for a uh, for buffet serving. And I think it's, it's, it's a neat concept because it allows for that flexibility and convertibility of those different spaces. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's a lot of uh, design going on. And I think a lot of it kind of revolves around this next concept and, and trend that um, we we'll talk a little bit about, which is, um, retailization, right? And so, um, you know, I want to kind of define that a little bit. It's something that some operators had started talking about a little bit last year, but I think it's really going to be key going forward. And the concept of retailization, this is taking an approach where you think about how you run your operation from kind of a retail um, profit-centered, profit-minded um, focus. You know, creating a brand and connecting to and, and treating residents and guests as shoppers, as opposed to, you know, as just a service and an expense to do. And so, you know, it's going to be a significant shift in, in how we approach our business. Um, and like I said, you got to start thinking about it from the mindset of it's a profit center as opposed to an expense center. Um, and I think as we look at how do we battle the shrinking margins and how do we continue to push um, choice and flexibility for residents to push occupancy growth and take advantage of that huge demand pressure. I think this is going to be a huge thing. You know, there's there's a lot of things that we can do around it. Um, but I know we've got some examples of uh, operators who are currently doing this. And so Bill, you had mentioned one in Iowa that really caught my eye when we were talking. Yeah, yeah that was a project I was involved in a couple of years ago, done by Western Home Communities. It was called Western Home Communities. It was called Jorgensen's Plaza, and that space had had which I think uh, Todd, you and I have talked about before. You know, uh, trying to keep trying to keep a bunch of different service styles close to a a, a main kitchen, but. That that facility had a, a restaurant. Well, first of all, from a, from a, a residency perspective, it had independent living townhomes, independent living apartments, assisted living apartments, uh, transitional care unit, memory care, uh, and full nursing, all all in a huge facility. And and obviously these townhomes were across the parking lot. Uh, but they have a a huge master kitchen, and it it services. A restaurant called Table 1912 that is open to the public, kind of a fine dining restaurant. Uh, it serves Gilmore's Pub, which is a, a pub that has pub fare and a full bar. Um, it serves the market, which is a grab and go area, along with sort of a little grocery store. 
Um, it has a full salon, hair salon that's open to the public. Um, and then it has two banquet facilities that are also built into the property and they do they do Sunday mass and, and, and religious services, but they also host weddings every weekend in their, in their two banquet facilities. So it's quite the, uh, quite the retailization of, of a facility. So. Yeah, it, it really caught my attention because uh, there's a, I think that's a good model and a good uh, approach. You know um, I recently had a conversation. Uh, I did a podcast recording um, with uh, the Medcor group. Um, they're creating a public restaurant. Uh, it's called Alma by Stephen Piles. And yeah. so it, Stephen Piles, you know, he's a James Beard award-winning chef, very well known with Southwest uh, cuisine. And so they partnered together with him to create this concept that is a public private restaurant, right? So it's open to the public. You can use open table to make reservations, yep. but it's part of their senior living offerings um, in that community in uh, North Austin. So it's, it's definitely a concept that's, uh, that's there and available to maximize revenues. But there's also the, the flip side of this, where how do you take this concept of, of retail and, and put it in maybe in an assisted living or memory care setting and, and where engagement is more the focus as opposed to generating just dollars and cents. And I know, Todd, you had an example we talked about, which I thought was fascinating and really, really cool. Yeah, we, uh, we, we've we worked um, on a number of just memory care facilities. One comes to mind, it's called the Welshire Medina. They also have a location in Bloomington, but they um, they like to put in, uh, they're, they're basically ice cream shops. They're almost like old, um, almost like 1950s style soda fountain ice cream shops. And I know Bill, you were there the other day. Um, I think you were taking pictures of the facility yeah. and you, you noticed that there were a number of families that would come. Um, you know. Yeah, I was there talking to, uh, to the owner Todd, who you know, and, and he was saying at two o'clock every afternoon, um, any resident that, that wants to obviously goes to this. Yeah, it's, it's like a fifties, like a, Farrell's type a Farrell's ice cream parlor if anybody knows yeah. what it's for like, it's like a soda shop yeah soda shop it's got red and white awnings and and uh it's inside but it's got outdoor furniture and it's really kind of a cute spot and a, a full soda fountain and and that tends to be the time at that memory care facility where where residents and their families gather so if you've got uh a loved one who's there in the memory care facility it, it's it's a great time and far less awkward than just stopping by and visiting someone in memory care in their room by yourself. So the multiple families there, virtually all the residents having, uh, you know, uh, banana splits or chocolate ice cream cones together, families talking to each other, residents talking to their families. It just made, it was, it was kind of a heartwarming scene and they're down there for about half an hour or so having ice cream every day at two. So if you're looking to stop in and see your your family member that's a great time to just pop in at two o'clock have some ice cream and and uh and and it's like i said probably a far less awkward visit than sitting alone in a room together yeah, yeah. And i think they, they actually they actually have a couple of them um i think i think medina has two different ice they, cream shops do, that yeah. are similar in design and then yep they plan on adding more as they add wings on to the facility and i know bloomington has i think three so yeah it's it's very cool yeah. yeah. And, and for me, that concept kind of takes that retailization, not just to the bottom line profit margin, right? The, just the business side, it kind of carries over into that. Like, how do you create a sense of community? How do you create better resident engagement? Um, and it's all about that mindset of how do we create something that has that concept of retail thinking, retail approach, which is unique, um, but still kind of meets the, the mission of what we do in senior living. So um, let's shift a little bit. Let's talk about tech, right? I know a lot of the, the people that are on the webinar want to know what kind of cool gadgets and gizmos and things can we be looking for um, in the coming months? And so uh, got three main areas I think we should talk about. And obviously, the first is the service and dining enhancements, right? And one of the things that I think is going to be a great carryover is kiosk serving, right? You know, there's a lot of, of 
retail commercial restaurants that use, use kiosks, it's a very familiar thing. We're seeing more and more of it, especially with staffing being an issue. But I think one of the things that we should think about for senior living to get kind of ahead of that curve is what you might think of as the kiosk in your pocket, right? Your smartphone. And, you know, there's a lot of talk around tech and, and older residents and, and older um, aging population. What does that look like? Well, there's statistics out there and, you know, 83% of 50 to 64 year olds have a smartphone um, and 65 plus, which is the target market for active adult independent living uh, and up, 61% have that. And so when you start thinking about tech and how you're going to do this, I think there's a huge opportunity there for a lot more resident control in how they order, what they do. And I think it's a unique um, piece of the puzzle for us to really look at and consider. Um, and Todd, you talked a little bit about induction systems earlier. Um, I'm curious what you're seeing from service and dining enhancements, um, especially post COVID, how that's impacted what we're doing. Yeah, coming out of COVID, definitely. Um, and during COVID, we, uh, we did have a, a pretty high demand, obviously, for people had to eat in their rooms. So the biggest thing was, you know, how are you going to be able to keep your food product hot while it's being delivered and make sure that it's piping hot when it gets to that resident's room? And uh, there's induction systems out there that energize a base of a plate, basically. Uh, it takes like five seconds. They energize it. They put a cover on it and that'll hold for a couple of hours. There's companies out there like Dynex, Aladdin that make that kind of thing. Um, and I, and that's, that's been something that has really stuck with um, locations. We've provided a lot of them post COVID for those residents that are eating in their room for whatever reason it might be. It could be maybe they're sick or maybe they enjoy eating in their room. Maybe they are a, uh, a TCU resident, they've had a hip replacement and they really, they, either they cannot get, you know, out to a, a main area to eat or they would prefer to eat by themselves. They're only going to be maybe in that unit for a week or two. Um, so that's one thing that has, um, we've seen a lot of. Yeah. And, you know, that expanded offerings with the ventless options you were talking about, that also really makes a huge uh, impact in this area too, I think. Um, you know, I'm also curious, you know, one of the other areas in tech that's going to be, I think, key when thinking about labor and staffing, right? We, we lost 300,000 workers. Um, and so what are some examples of, of some tech and some equipment that you guys have seen out there that can really help with either redistributing the available staff we have or reducing the amount of staff we need to kind of help with those concerns? Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that I, we've been seeing a lot of, and, it, and it's been out there for quite some time, is just the, the ability, programmable combi ovens, self-cleaning combi ovens, um, combi ovens that also communicate direct with your phone so that you know that there's a, you know, you can program them menu items. So no matter who gets, um, is in the kitchen, you know, cooking the meal, there'll be a consistency of product if you've got a pre-programmed um, menu item in there. So no matter um, if it's the you know, 18 year old kid that just got hired or if it's the 65 year old person that's been working there for a period of time, you can get some consistency by pre-programming these items, getting combi ovens uh, working in there. I mean, one thing that um, you have to make sure is you know, when you're purchasing a combi oven that it's actually going to be used in combi mode. We do go into some facilities that we've um, sold combi ovens to and they're just using them as a steamer or they're only using them as a convection oven. And that ends up being a pretty expensive piece of equipment for not being able to use. And I think a lot of that is just a training issue with manufacturers being able to spend time in those facilities, making sure that people get trained properly on those pieces. But same thing really with all the rapid cooking um, venues out there, the ventless cooking pieces of equipment, they also are able to uh, pre-program, you know, huge amounts of menu items in there that, again, will be consistent and is very easy to use, you know, put the product in, push the button, uh, away it comes and, and, it's, and it's good and it's hot and it's cooked the way it should be. So that's a couple, couple items anyway. Yeah, and I, I feel like we've got to mention robotics, right? Robotics are out there, they're talking about it. 
everybody's seen the serving robots with the various different models, but we also have production and prep robots too, right? Like there's, we've got robotic pizza makers. There's the Robo Joe. It's the coffee shop attendant that can really kind of help with that. So there's a lot of good um, tools out there in the robotics field as well. And so the, the last point, and I don't want to deep dive into it too much, but I think really understanding and managing data, right, is going to be important going forward. You know, a lot of operators are using point of sale, but it's not a want anymore. It's a need. You know, if you really truly want to make a lot of headway with some of the things we've been talking about, kind of looking for a like full service restaurant management software, how does that work? How do you implement that? Uh, I think is going to be really important, you know, and it's really just about integrating all of your systems so that the information from the oven and the point of sale data and resident engagement, all those things are all put together so you can really make timely decisions in your operation for purchasing and staffing and, and the like. So I know we've only got a couple more minutes, but I want to just look forward, right? Let's think ahead, like past 2023, what do we need to be thinking about in 2024 and beyond? Um, I have three quick points and then I'll ask you both uh, your thoughts, but I think what a definition of a restaurant is will change. That's what we're seeing in the hospitality industry. I think there's some opportunity there for senior living to mimic and do some really cool things. The second is, you know, older adults are going to be a growing proportion of the labor force. So people that maybe we considered as residents may actually be employees. And so a lot of these things that we're talking about, you know, Todd, you mentioned that, like, how do you create opportunity for those individuals to be successful? Um, and then the third piece, which is something we talked about briefly with retailization is there's opportunity for us in senior living to capture food service market share, you know, convenience stores, grocery stores, like what Bill said with an operator, that's going to be an opportunity. Delivery options in smaller markets, you know, that's a revenue opportunity for senior living operators. Ghost kitchens and, and more off-premise type traffic in general, I think is really going to be something that if done correctly and wisely, senior living can tap into to drive revenues and, and margins. And so, um, any thoughts from, from either of you, Bill, do you have anything? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we had talked before about this notion of, of sort of a senior drift, you know, people tend to retire and, and head to warmer climates, even warmer climates for senior living, but as their health begins to deteriorate, they tend to move back home near their adult kids. And, and when they're making a decision as to where to live, dining options are a huge driver of occupancy. And I think I think uh, developers and operators need to remember that. I think uh, it's not just the food. When we talk about about dining options, and uh, it, it a lot of it comes back to what does the dining room look like? What does the grab and go area look like? What does the pub look like? And the last thing an old person wants is to be sitting in a dining room that looks like it was designed for old people to sit in and eat. So. I think the incremental cost of, of making it special by involving, you know, people who know what they're doing and, and involving materials and furnishings and things like that, that make it special will help drive occupancy. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it is a country club type setting, like you mentioned, Bill. I mean, um, some of these senior living facilities are just gorgeous inside. They're, they're amazing. Um, what the finishes that are chosen and the furniture and and how it comes together and really the offerings they have, you know, whether it's a, a golf simulator or whether it's, uh, you know, the bars, the, the different venues that we talked about, I think that's uh, really going to you know, play a, a, an important part uh, in the future of senior living. Definitely. Yeah, no, a lot of evolution coming, I think, over the next 12, 18, 36 months, so, uh, and beyond, so. Um, Britt, uh, any questions from the audience uh, that we can answer for them? Yes, actually, Erin, I have a question for you. The question is, one of the biggest drawbacks to the growth of outsourcing food service to third parties through third party co companies is the traditional PRD cost structure, which has been the billing norm for the last 25 years. How do you approach the outdated PRD billing model and deliver on consumer and operator expectations for a more retail-driven business model 
meaning restaurant style menus with varied prices, multiple dining venues, cafes with fee for service items and liquor bars as examples. Yeah, um, there's a lot there, but I think from, from my perspective, you know, um, being someone that works with smaller operators to keep things in house as much as possible, you know, there's always a time and a place for a third party contract um, if you're looking for that kind of expertise. But if you want to keep it in house, you really have to, at the top, change your mindset towards what is the purpose of your food service operation, right? Is it there to just do the three squares and check the regulatory box? Or is it really there to create a, a marketing opportunity, to create a, a revenue opportunity? It's really about creating that profit mindset. When you think about training and, and developing your teams to think, I got to make money doing this because if I don't, my restaurant will close, right? That's what restaurant operators do. They know if they don't make money, that they're going to have to close up shop. And I think if senior living operators can start with that mindset, you know, we have huge advantages um, with GPOs and group purchasing contracts, with all sorts of things, with food, with equipment, um, with software and technology that we can, I think, capitalize on and just kind of think about the, the demographics coming in, they will have disposable income. They will be accustomed to paying a premium for a premium product, right? If you're doing three squares, they're not giving you more. But if you do something above and beyond, like the things that, that Bill and Todd have talked about with some of these unique outlets and that kind of overarching concept, I think you can really create something unique to your operation that'll set you apart in markets. If you do it now, you'll be ahead of the curve because there are no, there are operators talking about it, but there aren't very many doing it right now. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, all of you. That was really great information. Um, if any of the webinar attendees have any additional questions uh, regarding uh, Aaron's company and some of the consulting that he does for owners, operators. I mean, he does this across the country in terms of operations and training and setting different programs in place or anything related to food service design and contract. Todd and Bill's information is on the screen. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Just a reminder that this presentation has been sponsored by Belcher Companies. No one knows food service like we know food service. From design, renovations, kitchen equipment, tabletop, and smallwares, let's pursue your passion. Contact us today. Thank you all. We'll see you again soon.